Damas and Aaron. One of the reasons why history grabs me the way it does is that there are so many things out there in our everyday life that we tend to take very much for granted. And examining our history compels us to look very closely at what we're doing here, how we got here, and the things that had to be done in order to survive this remarkable journey. Now, the bulk of my life has existed in and around the New York area, but has also involved a lot of trips up and down the Northeast Corridor. Our annual retreat off Exit 92, then a winding half hour up Route 1 to the Block Island Ferry. Or my many years of traveling to Pawtucket, Rhode Island, the birthplace of the Industrial Revolution. I've done it by car, by train, and yes, in the air. And I'm as guilty as anyone in not just taking those various means of transportation for granted, but in actually taking the pathways themselves for granted, the road itself. Season one of Island has already introduced a very important road that would be called De Wikwaskik Way when the Dutch first happened upon it in the 1620s. And we do reach forward a bit to prognosticate that this Indian path running on an uneven north-south route through the island of Manhattan would eventually evolve into what we call Broadway today. Well, that very pathway that was tamped down by the souls of wayward Algonquins centuries before any European ever set foot on this idyllic, bountiful island was in fact the southern reach of what would become the single most important stretch of road in our nation's history. In fact, it was the critical and necessary artery that would give life to the greatest nation mankind would ever know. And while this podcast focuses on the incredible history of this incredible place that we now call New York, our guest today is a guru on an adjacent and connective story, one that links and relies on this incredible story, but which propels northward to a tiny settlement that in 1633 was home to barely a few hundred Calvinists who were connected to the rest of the world, such as it was, by 3,000 miles of ocean to the east and a nearly impassable trail through unforgiving wilderness to the south. But the really amazing thing about this story is not just that it illustrates the evolution of travel between the two key cities that would spawn a revolution, but that in the process, this road would in turn give birth to the multi-billion dollar media industry that dominates our lives and minds today. How? Well, (laughs) it has a lot to do with a young man who was born on the northern end of that pathway on a brittle winter day in 1706, who would apply his own brand of scientific analysis to the development and systematic functionality of that road that would enable the remarkable exchange of information that we also take very much for granted today. The exchange of information that we now call the United States Postal Service. Really. (laughs) But what really motivated the brilliant young Benjamin Franklin in devising ways and means by which to move letters swiftly and securely up and down this burgeoning highway was not in fact the royal crown by whom he was employed since he was a 21-year-old. But rather, what really motivated Benjamin Franklin was that this roadway and the system that he was instrumental in advancing was in fact the sole means by which to propagate his message, his mission, and his true purpose, which was the printed word of the American people. Because in truth, that was the very means by which this band of determined refugees would rise up to become the most purposeful and critical system of government in the history of mankind. Through this fascinating journey, we braved this daunting trek before telephones and combustion engines, before lights or pavement, when the only refuge along this harrowing two to three week voyage came in the form of candlelit establishments such as Billings Inn near Sharon, Mass with its inquisitive hostess, or Woodcock's Tavern near North Attleboro, or Haven's Tavern in North Kingstown, Rhode Island, 
which was not too far from the other tavern run by the irascible Mr. Devil and his homely twin daughters. And thanks to fast riding souls, including a bold young Paul Revere, this artery of intelligence would prove critical to fostering key communication between these two colonial cities, enabling these patriots to do the unthinkable, to challenge and defeat the greatest power on earth. The book is the king's best highway, the lost history of the Boston Post Road, the route that made America. Damas and Aaron, mesdames and messieurs, Damas y caballeros, ladies and gentlemen, it is my great honor to finally meet the author of one of my favorite books of all time, author Eric Jaffe. Welcome, Manir. Thank you so much, Chance. That was an amazing introduction. It's <laughs> wonderful to be here. It's wonderful to have you. And by the way, I do want to point out that we were not looking for the ukulele player, Eric Jaffe. <laughs> <laughs> we were not looking for the drag impresario or the minor league baseball pitcher. We definitely wanted you. There's quite a few of us, but uh, <laughs> I'm happy to be here on behalf of all of them. Wonderful. Well, clearly this uh, this book, your book fascinates me. I read it, I think, close to a decade ago, um, the first time. And as yeah. I told you, I've read it a few times because <laughs> there's, there's so much in there. Yeah. You know, um, while I know this story of New York pretty well, this you know, takes me out of my wheelhouse a little bit. And um, there's just a lot there. And you cover, like I say, you go back to you know, when there was no Europeans here yet, right. when it was literally an Indian path. And this this idea of illustrating this history in the form of a road, it just it really grabbed me in a certain way. Right. And, I, you know, I, I think it's really important. History can be very boring. And it's something <laughs> I kind of conjure and deal with all the time. It's like, Chance, you're doing a history podcast. You got to not be boring. You know? <laughs> And when you illustrated in a way like you did, I, for me, it really just jumped out and, mm -hmm. and came to life. It was really well done. I appreciate that. I mean, the, the truth is that was my hope from the start to kind of portray the road as a character and make this almost a biography. And so I actually came across this road for the first time when I was a graduate student studying journalism. I had just moved to New York. This was over 15 years ago. I've been here ever since. Uh, and there's... I was taking a tour of the Bronx, which is where I would do my reporting. And there's a road still in the Bronx called Boston Road. Mm -hmm. And it's not far away from Yankee Stadium. And you have to ask yourself, what is anything named after Boston doing in this part of New York City? Um, and the answer, as I looked it up, was, of course, that there's this historic road that connects New York and Boston. Um, but the truth is, as I explored deeper, uh, there had really only been one study of the Boston Post Road done in the very early 19, uh, 20th century. So like we're talking 1913 um, by a man named Stephen Jenkins. He had done a wonderful um, but very antiquarian job of kind of mapping exactly where the road had gone, what cities it went through, who traveled along it at certain times, uh, just extremely great detail if you wanted that history. But what I was very curious in is, could you kind of treat this road, as I mentioned, like a character, something that evolves over time, the way we evolve over time, something that changes and adapts to its surrounding, but also influences its surroundings? Um, and what would that mean as we tried to trace that social history of something um, that was so important to us? Well, bravo. You did it magnificently. And I did. I do look at the sources now that I'm sort of a history guy. <laughs> I read the footnotes that I didn't used to read. And uh, there's a lot of overlap in the, the sources in your book and your history, which is which is just remarkable, really, how deep you go. Mm. Um, but Broadhead, Stokes, E.B. Yeah. O'Callaghan, Jameson, uh, the Journal of David Peter DeVries. I, I, I know all of those sources. And you, you also cite my friend Charlie Gehring, who yeah, I know okay. really well. He's been instrumental in getting, you know, helping me get this podcast going and introducing me to, you know, many of the historians and scholars. You can't do history without standing on a lot of shoulders. It, it, exactly, exactly. And it is a, it's sort of a club, you know, that you, <laughs> you, you, if you can get into, it's a good club to be in. <laughs> um, but this story, you, you know, the, the story of these roads, this this New York to Boston route, they they it's a 
it, it really relies. It's a cohabitational story of these two cities. And you mm. you kind of one does pivot off the other. And when that stuff, that stuff interests me. I like when when there's like special guests in mm. history. Um, <laughs> did, did you read comics growing up? I did not really. No. All right. All right. Well, I was a Justice League guy. And like, <laughs> okay. I, I like Justice League because like the Green Lantern would come visit, you know, or, or <laughs> right. Hawkman would make an appearance. But the cameos. And, yeah, the cameo. And so when I was reading about, I'm very into Minwee, Pierre Minwee, who <laughs> most New Yorkers yeah. refer to him as Peter Minuet, right. but his name <laughs> was Minwee. And he was, you know, when he was uh, director here, governor here, and he was very uh, hands-on. He was very instrumental in, in, bringing this place out of the dark dark ages and hmm. setting it in the right direction and he had a lot of correspondences with bradford and the the puritans up, up in plymouth and um i i and they 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 spoke in dutch they they corresponded in dutch which was neither of their languages hmm. it was like the middle ground that they would use and um it was it was just so fascinating to me and i think a lot of people don't even know the the pilgrims, you know, the mm. Mayflower pilgrims and the Walloons who founded, who really created a city, so to speak, out of New York, they were all friends in Leiden yeah. before they came yeah. over here. Yeah. I mean, to me, the, the characters who kind of really emerge as, you know, uh, at the forefront of this story, as I was studying it, it's, you know, you got Governor Francis Lovelace of New York, um, and then you've got Governor John Winthrop Jr. of Connecticut, who of course was the son of the Massachusetts Bay original John Winthrop. And so you have that natural connection of personalities from New York to Boston via Connecticut. But it is really John Winthrop Jr., the son, who kind of leaves this lasting impression and really understands the road that would become the first postal road in the country's history. And you have to kind of remember as you do that at this time, the English were constantly under threat from the Dutch, right? It was going back and forth, all of these territories. And so when you're someone like Francis Lovelace and you're thinking about how to fortify yourself against that potential threat, for him, he wasn't really, you know, kind of, a, you know, a wartime person exactly. He was much more of a thinker. And so he wanted to establish this communication route between New York and Boston and through Connecticut and he called it this handsomer defense. He was just somebody who really wanted information as a means to preparation and what to do next. And that's how uh, this whole thing gets started in the end of the 17th century. And you're referring to Francis Lovelace, who was the governor in the 1670s, right after yes. the English had taken control of New Netherland, turned it into New York. Exactly. Correct. Right. Yes. Yeah. And it, you have a you paint a very impressive uh, illustration of of uh, Winthrop Jr., who's not my favorite guy. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and, you know, I don't know. He to me, he's always the guy who stole New York. But sure. <laughs> right. Yeah, I got it. That <laughs> depends he what side you're on. Yeah. yeah, exactly. I guess it depends on which way you're looking at it. But yes, it very actually I learned a lot about him from your book. I didn't know that much about him. He's a very impressive guy. But the title itself, The King's Best Highway, mm -hmm. comes into play in the early developmental phase of the story. Way back is before the Declaration of Independence. Uh, I believe it was. Well, do you tell me when the King's Best Highway started uh, being used for this this route? Yeah. So the King's Best Highway is actually a reference to part of the letter that Governor Lovelace wrote to Governor John Winthrop Jr. And he had the very first postal rider who left the bottom tip of Manhattan, January 22nd, 1673. He had this post rider visit John Winthrop Jr. And the whole point of this exploration was to plot out where a route could go between New York and Boston every two weeks to, again, kind of fortify them with new information against potential threats from the outside world, and also kind of just to stimulate the economy, the local economy, trade, discussion, all of the other benefits that something like this would have. Um, and he really asked a lot of this post rider, right? We think of, you know, postal workers a certain way today, uh, unfairly, but we do. And this very first postal rider was supposed to be active, 
stout. The word he used was indefatigable. He had to kind of journey through snow, ice, all of the elements. He had to mark trees so that other travelers could find their way. He had to scout locations for inns, really an entrepreneur and a delivery person in one. And so this initial journey, Francis Lovelace asks John Winthrop Jr. to help map out the King's Best Highway. And so that's just kind of a casual name. It was never the official name of the road. It became the post road uh, shortly after that. The rider was Matthias Nichols, I believe. And he left the south end of New York on January 22nd, 1673. They had to pick the coldest day of the year to send this guy out on a horse <laughs> to ride to Boston. Well, that's when the Dutch were threatening. And actually, you know, this is one of the things where you write a book when you're young. When I go back to that, it, it seems like Matthias Nichols is the name of the post writer the way I wrote it. But actually, he's not. He's one of the administrators from Francis Lovelace. We don't know the exact name of the very first post writer. That has been lost to history as far as I was able to um, discern and discover. The closest I ever found was a letter around that time in the Massachusetts Bay Historical Society that is signed by someone named Edward Messenger. Now, that doesn't sound like a real name to me. That sounds like potentially uh, often Native Americans would be called by certain names that described actually what they were doing. That's very possible in this case, but we don't know for sure the name. So, okay, fine. So we don't know. We, there, were, there were plenty of them, and it was a hell of a trip. It wasn't something I would envy. I mean, so we're talking about you leaving on horseback. Yep. Guy's literally got a satchel right. over his shoulder, and he's going to ride to Boston, which should take how long in 1673? It was supposed to take two weeks there and back. We know for sure he didn't do that uh, on the way there because the letter back from Governor John Leverett of Massachusetts Bay was signed and dated February 11th. So that's already almost three weeks in. Uh, so maybe he made it back in six weeks. We don't actually know when he returned. Now, OK, at this point, it literally was a trail in some places. There were rivers he had to go through or over. There were you, you point out that at some point the trail might be, you know, 30 inches wide or mm. thereabouts. There were rocks you, you describe um, actually later in the story. You describe how dangerous and treacherous it was going along the shore in Rye, New York, and how yeah. rocky that was. Um, let's talk about where this first rider in 1673, where did he go? Mm. Where did he stay the first night? Do you suppose? That's a great question. Um, that is not documented in history. Where he left from is the fort at the lower end of Manhattan today, Jordan. right around where Bowling Green is. Yep. Yeah, Fort James, which is yep. just below. If you're at the Charging Bull, which most people know, <laughs> right. you go straight toward south towards the water. And I, um, I, I always think it's right where the Alexander Hamilton Customs House is, which is where the Museum of the American Indian sits now. Yes, and there's actually a post office. There's a U.S. post office right next to there, um, which at least there was a few years ago the last time I visited, which I think is a nice echo of history. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, but as you know, you know, that rider would have followed up what we know today as Broadway, and then what became the Boston Post Road meandered through the east side for a little bit. Once it got toward the northern end of the island, it would go back west um, and catch some of the old Indian trails, and you could kind of get across onto the mainland through what's now the Bronx. Uh, and then you started to cut east. And eventually this rider would uh, end up going through New Haven and up the river toward Hartford. So he's he's probably camping out <laughs> yes. half the way, right? Probably. I yeah. mean, I can't imagine in January in that year what you're doing overnight. But so it, it would take him so arguably three weeks, two to three weeks to get up there through this trail definitely took him three weeks that first ride i think he got better over time what are the, one of the great part aspects of this book is the, the the phases of history that you that you illustrate as we go along and i want to talk about another specific voyage that you chronicle in this book and this that would be the first stagecoach hmm. voyage from New York to Boston. And that would have been, I believe that was a year after evacuation day. In other words, this is the year following when we won the, the revolutionary war, the British evacuate Manhattan Island, which they had occupied the entire revolutionary war. 
And I guess the aftermath of the Revolutionary War had a lot of similarities to perhaps the aftermath of World War II, where there was a lot of activity and new innovation and commerce flowing. Tell, tell me about that stagecoach ride in yeah. 16, 1784, I believe. 1784 is correct. Um, there had been attempts to start a stagecoach between New York and Boston many times. None of them worked out. Um, and the man who eventually got it to work and made it all function as one was um, a blacksmith by the name of Levi Pease, who actually lived in Springfield, Massachusetts, so nowhere near New York. Uh, but it was, as you described, the reason it didn't work is the trip was just so treacherous, right? Nobody wanted to make that trip. You were cutting through uh, the forest, you were traveling over rocks, roads weren't, wouldn't be paved for hundreds of years you know, after this, um, at least many, many years. So you had nothing like a smooth journey um, you know, you had no very little protection from the elements. You had to sleep um, in the next tavern. So as long as it took for you to get to that tavern, you had to ride. It just wasn't pleasant. Most people traveled by water. Um, but Levi Pease had this vision of a service that would connect New York and Boston. Um, and the reason he was able to pull it off where others failed, at least as far as I can tell, is that he had this kind of just unrelenting commitment to proving that the route would be reliable. So he would take this path and it wasn't just him. He organized, I think it was four people along the way who would kind of pass the baton on this great relay. Um, but he insisted that they would drive to New York, to Boston and back, even if there was no passengers, because he wanted to prove to the market, I'll take you there. Don't worry. I know it, you know, it might not be fun the whole way, but I'll get you there. Uh, and that's what made the difference in the end. And so people understand the, the reason going by water wasn't practical was just that, that most of that was commercial travel. That was mostly cargo ships going up and down the East Coast. And it also was um, as, as far as passenger travel, it was incredibly unreliable if there would be a vessel that could take them. And if so, if it would be delayed or waylaid. That's right. And also, you know, you don't really get those stops along the way. So if you only wanted to go halfway or part of the way, you're still going to have to get off and get some kind of transportation to your destination. So at least with the stagecoach, you knew exactly where you were getting, you were going through at every point. Right. So these guys like Levi Peace and um, the other fella, uh, Talmadge Hall mm, yeah. and some of the other ones, they I were- think Jacob they, Brown was one of them. Yeah. yeah. They were really visionary guys. I mean, people were like, well, you can't do this. You <laughs> can't go from, and it's so it's, that's what blows me away. And that's what fascinates me about history is that in, in the 16, the 1700s, oh, you can't, you can't get to Boston by land. Mm. No, it's just unthinkable. The, and again, the things that we take for granted, like a simple road, is it really what it took to develop it? So this this first trip, this first stagecoach trip that left New York, the, the south end of New York, uh, on that day in 1784, they, they travelers would have eaten breakfast at Fort Washington be, before exiting Manhattan at Kingsbridge. Tell us about Kingsbridge. Um, every single bridge and every single point of interaction with water or hillsides or rocks was just treacherous. Uh, and you kind of close the curtain in the stagecoach and you kind of hope for the best. What they eventually started to do was they would establish, you know, ferrymen on one side um, to help move you across the water or lead you across a bridge just to make sure it was safer. Again, this was part of Levi P's establishing what could be considered a reliable, uh, a reliable journey there. Now, along the way, because, as I said, there's nothing there, yeah. especially for that first rider in the 1673 ride. There was literally nothing along the way other than perhaps some native bands, hmm. some native tribes along the way that may have helped him or may not have. But as this road or this pathway developed, what developed alongside it were these taverns that became they were de facto post offices as well yeah. as places to eat, rest. Um, exchange information tell us about the, the some of the taverns that these riders that these travelers would have uh rested at along this route that's right so in every um you know new england and colonial town 
you had two really important buildings. You had your meeting house, which was basically the, the place of gathering and worship, and you had your tavern, which is where everyone spent the rest of the time. And so the person who ran the tavern, you know, became kind of this global correspondent for information around the world. So news would come in from across Europe, letters would get dropped off at the tavern, people would come to the tavern to pick up their letters, they'd open the letters there, they'd discuss the contents of it, and they'd go on their day and you see these tavern proprietors over time just accumulating a tremendous amount of information. And what happens is they start to use that information to create their own newsletters. And so the natural synergy of the fact that the post writer had to stop in these taverns to pick up new letters and drop off new letters, um, and the fact that these tavern proprietors were learning all this information created this system where tavern proprietors eventually ended up becoming uh, newspaper you know, leaders um, and, and the people that published and, and distributed this information along the route. Again, the things we take for granted today, just the level of communication, there was nothing electronic and hmm. even the printed word, you had to get it from one place to another. And these, these taverns were, it's hard for us to imagine today what these taverns were, but they were, they were almost like our internet providers because hmm. they were providing the ability to communicate with other people. I think the thing that, that really hit home for me when I was doing the book, and it sounds obvious now, but it, it didn't at the time, is that for so long in the country's history and the world's history, frankly, transportation was communication. You could not communicate without traveling. And so that's how these two things eventually become so um, you know, enmeshed together as the story of the development of this country where the news and the transportation and the mail, um, those are all developed by the same people. Yeah, it's really amazing. That, that was another aspect of the book is just how much came out of this road that that it not only developed the means of transportation but the communication in this in this country and it it, it was really fascinating to see that develop and um it tells us it, it tells me so much about what it took to to create these two incredible cities and um it's it, you also then you go further on and you you go on and talk about the effects following the Erie Canal and how mm. that really uh, that was sort of put put New York on the uh, you know on 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 uh, into hyperspace. Mm. I know that the population of New York following the opening of the Erie Canal quadrupled in the mm. next twenty years. Right. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that's really interesting about that is if you think about the rivalry today that New York has with Boston, a friendly rivalry in many ways, but it's definitely a rivalry. At that time, everybody in Boston, everybody in Massachusetts, they wanted their own Erie Canal. They wanted their canal. It didn't matter how much it costed. So they spent years and years drawing up these extremely extravagant and expensive plans to build a canal. And there was one person in particular, his name was Nathan Hale. He was actually the nephew of the famous Nathan Hale who was convinced that canals were not the future of transportation, that railroads, this thing that at that time was just uh, a, a little bit of a rail on top of an existing road pulled by a horse. So not even what we think of as railroads today, but he saw railroads as the real future. And he fought tooth and nail. He had his own newspaper again, getting back to the, the impact of information. And he would continually try to popularize this concept of railroads, which was developing more rapidly in England. And over time, eventually he won out and convinced Bostonians and Massachusetts to create what ended up being the first three railroad lines in American history. And now we know, of course, that was absolutely the right decision because canals had a very limited role in the future of transportation. Amazing, amazing. Eric, there's something so incredibly admirable and important, I think, about telling these stories, about telling them in a compelling and palatable ways. You know, history is cool for me, largely because it's a stamp of truth. I mean, when we talk about what might happen or what, what should happen or what this party or that party or this radical faction wants to have happen, but history is the stamp in time of what really happened what actually happened with, without, and when it's told with no political influence, 
to me, it's sacred. I mean, it's gospel because because it's who we are. It's the very lessons from which we should learn. Now, are people today, are American people today making a mistake in looking back through our history, through a lens that seeks only perfection and saintliness while overlooking the vastness of what they actually, these people actually brought to this nation and, and to this world? What do you, what do you think? Hmm. It's interesting. I think what, one of the things I did see along this road, you know, time after time was an appreciation of the history, you know, despite a desire to move forward. So you actually, you look at the final stretch of I-95 that was completed between New York and Boston. And this would have been in 1964, it connected Connecticut and Rhode Island. Um, and what did they do to celebrate the opening of this final strip of road? You would think, oh, maybe we'll get the governor or somebody in a Mustang and we'll zip through and we'll just show that this is the future and this is the technology of today. No, that's not what they did. They put on costumes like colonists, they got in a stagecoach, they got some horses together, and the very first trip along that final stretch of I-95 was a stagecoach reminiscence uh, that called to mind specifically the old Boston Post Road. And I think so what you see along the line is, of course, we want to make progress, but we want to kind of whatever it takes, start to at least try clawing back those parts of the history that we consider the ones very important to who we are today. Actually, you, you raised... Um, Ben Franklin, which I, I really feel like is the true kind of underappreciated hero of, of this road and of this story and of this moment um, in American history. I mean, of course, Ben Franklin is not underappreciated in, in any respect, but his role as a postmaster, I guess you could argue, is his most underappreciated role of the many things he accomplished. And, and I just, I want to kind of note exactly what he did to revolutionize what ended up being uh, what we know today as the modern postal service. So it really didn't work very well for many, many years. It just cost too much money to operate a postal service and the crown couldn't care less about whether or not the colonists had a successful postal service. So they didn't give any money to us. So Ben Franklin, he took his scientific, his very rational, logical, sequential mind, and he did this tour of the Boston Post Road in 1753 and 1754 and he just remade the entire system. He invented rate tables so that you could see exactly how far a piece of uh, a piece of mail had traveled, and so you knew exactly how much it cost. He created what we know today as the dead letter office because all these letters were just piling up, and it was impossible to organize them. He created um, an odometer that could um, tick off when a mile had passed. And so you see these mile marker stones between New York and Boston start to emerge in the years afterwards. That was because De Ben Franklin said, we need to know exactly how far you've traveled. And the best way to do that is to make a device that can count how far you've traveled and then to put a little signif signifier there to show you how far you've traveled. And it seems obvious to us now, but it was so cutting edge and different then. And of course, what happens is within a few years, the post office is profitable and the throne starts to take an interest in the American mail. It's, it's amazing. It, it, he, he really was one of those brilliant minds that is, it, it, it is largely overlooked. We, I don't think <laughs> yeah. because he wasn't a president, you know, I don't think he's given his proper uh, due in, in the, in, in the scope of all, our history, but he's as, a, he's as important as any American ever was to, to who we are today. He was an incredible person, incredible thinker. Um, yeah. I loved, I loved. <laughs> I think that's your, fair. Yeah. Phenomenal, phenomenal story. Well, Mr. Eric Jaffe, your dedication to this remarkable story is clearly driven by a special passion that I share and your work is priceless in its lessons and in the awareness that it instills in people, myself included, but particularly in our students and young people, not just here in these United States, but everywhere. Because in the immortal words of the great Thomas Paine, the cause of America is in great measure the cause of all mankind. And I believe that in my heart and soul. There's something sacred about not just telling this remarkable story, but in telling it in an untarnished way that's not biased by any any uh, influence and telling it in a way that makes people want to listen, especially people today, because this story is who we are. And if we listen very carefully to it, it will also tell us who we can become. 
you and I are officially co-conspirators in a holy <laughs> pursuit that is bestowing our true and lost history upon the people of this earth, the story of the greatest nation on earth. Your book is timeless, and I commend you on a job remarkably well done. And I thank you immensely for taking the time to come on and share your knowledge, spirit, and insight with us. And we look forward to following your career as it moves forward as well. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, Chance. Appreciate the opportunity. Absolutely. I look forward to talking to you soon. You too. Author Eric Jaffe, ladies and gentlemen. The book is The King's Best Highway, The Lost History of the Boston Post Road, The Route That Made America. Available at all major booksellers and also via the link on our website and also at Eric's website, eric-jaffe.com. If you're enjoying us on YouTube, please be sure to hit the subscribe button to get every episode. And don't forget to tune in to our companion podcast, Island, the incredible history of the island of Manhattan from 1609 to 1909. History is cool. Island Voices is a production of Chance Kelly, Inc. and may not be reproduced or re-exhibited in any manner in whole or in part without authorization. Thank you.